I received many questions from you regarding my work in physics, which preceded by many decades my work in psychology. So this video is intended for people with background in modern physics. It would be largely incomprehensible to the rest of you. But what I'm going to do, I am dividing this video in two parts. The first part is more philosophical. I'm going to deal with uh, vexing, vexing questions and philosophical conundrums in various physical theories, relativity, quantum mechanics, and so on and so forth, questions which are far from answered. And then the second part I'm going to dedicate to my work in physics as it had been extended and taken light years away by Eitan Suchard. So you could watch the first part, you could fast forward to the second part, or you can watch both parts. I hope that by the end of the video you will have a, a better grasp um, as to what it is that I'm doing in philosophy, in, uh, psychology, in physics, <laughs> sorry. So let's start with the philosophy of physics. Einstein was actually a Newtonian. He was an extension of Newton. He was a de deterministic natural philosopher. And exactly like Newton, he accepted the pre-existence of space-time and of masses. As a physicist, Einstein did not bother with the question of where, mass, where did masses come from? Where did, did, did space-time emanate from? Space-time and masses were a given. Einstein also used the very same language elements as did all the physicists before him, from Newton to Poincaré. So, while he while he did innovate in the sense that he he had a fresh look a fresh way of looking at things as he himself had described it a child's way of looking at things he didn't really change physics fundamentally his work is largely especially i mean his relativity theories is largely accepted as an extension of newton's work and as far as the language of physics, he was not a great innovator at all. The only element, the only part of his work which was a real departure from the past was to suggest that gravity in general um, theory, in general relativity theory, to suggest that gravity was a language element. The word we use to describe the impact that masses have on the shape of space-time and also the word we use gravity to describe the effects of acceleration so he kind of created an equivalence equivalency between uh, masses acceleration and gravitation that was a departure from the past masses have properties time space could be one of these properties. It is not a multiplication of entities. Parsimony is preserved. Actually, if we regard space-time as a property of masses, parsimony is enhanced because instead of having two entities, space-time and masses separately, we now have only one entity, masses with a space-time quality or a space-time property. And so, to assume, to assume that there must be a medium, a container, within which masses interact, and in which they are embedded, this was the thinking in the 19th century. Physicists at that time called the medium or the container ether. But of course, there's no rigorous way to support such an assumption. Modern physicists, modern physics, rejects the, the description of the world as a container within which masses move and interact. 
Space-time is not a pre-existing medium. It's not a container within which masses exist and interact. Space-time is the outcome of such interactions, not a precondition. At least the shape of space-time is the outcome of these interactions. And in my work, it is the outcome of these interactions. In other words, without masses, there's no space-time. And masses themselves are actually aspects of time. But we'll come to that in the second part of the video. Like God, space-time is a premise which adds nothing to our understanding and is dispensable. We can offer a comprehensive explanatory description of the universe without insisting on space-time as a boundary condition. My work, as developed by Ethan Suchard, also assumes that masses are aspects of time, but I see no need to add any further conditions. Generally, as a general rule, intuition and common sense have no place in physics. It is definitely a bad scientific practice to add yet another third entity to account for the effects of masses on space-time. It defies Occam's razor and adds nothing to our understanding of the world because we are managing very well without it. And finally, space-time, masses, and geometry, these are mere language elements. They are epistemic entities, not ontological ones. Epistemic entities that correspond to observations. So when we say space-time, masses, when we use geometry, we are merely using language to describe our observations. It is debatable whether these elements have any precise, monovalent, mappable ontological equivalents. They are useful as shorthand, they are conducive to communication, and they also yield falsifiable predictions. But they do not possess any extraneous meaning out there in reality. They are context-dependent, they are theory-specific. For example, in my theory, there are no masses and no space-time at all, not even remotely, there's no motion. And yet I have managed to describe the universe and to account for all the phenomena in the universe perfectly, to derive all the equations of physics perfectly, to perfection, without using space-time, masses, or motion. And just to clarify, when I use the phrase comprehensive explanatory principle, uh, description of the universe, I mean a language that yields falsifiable predictions. That is the best that we can ever aspire to, to know everything about the language that we are using, to leverage the language to yield predictions about future observations, not predictions about reality, mind you. Reality is inaccessible to us. Only our experiments are accessible to us. And so we use language to yield predictions about future observations, and then we're able to falsify them in experiments. This is the scientific method. Only bad scientists, bad physicists, presume to explore the world out there and to reach the truth. Science is asymptotic to both the world and the truth. So today I want to explore in the philosophical part of this video, I want to explore three concepts in physics. The continuum, which is space-time, measurement, and time itself. Let's start with the continuum. The problem of the continuum versus discreteness seems to be related to the issue of infinity and finiteness. The number of points in a line served as the logical floodgate which led to the development of set, set theory by Cantor at the end of the 19th century. It took almost another century to demonstrate the problematic nature of some of Cantor's thinking. Cohen completed Gödel's work only in 1963. But continuity can be finite, and the connection is most times misleading rather than illuminating. Let's delve deeper. Intuition tells us that the world is continuous 
and contiguous. This seems to be the state of things which is devoid of characteristics other than its very existence. And yet, whenever we direct the microscope of scientific discipline at the world, whenever we train our scientific method upon reality, we encounter quantized, segregated, distinct, and discrete entities and worldviews, pictures. This atomization seems to be the natural state of things. So why did evolution resort to the false perception of a continuum when reality is actually discrete? And how can a machine, which is bound to be discrete by virtue of its naturalness, this machine, the brain, how it, how it can misperceive a continuum? The, the brain is a discrete machine because it's natural and nature is discrete. Why does it misperceive fake news continuum? The continuum is an external mental category which is imposed by us on our observations and on the resulting data. The continuum serves as an idealized approximation of reality, a model which is asymptotic to the universe as it is. The continuum gives rise to the concepts of quality, emergence, function, derivation, influence, force, interaction, fields, quantum measurement, processes, and a host of other holistic ways of relating to our environment. The other pole, the quantized model of the world, conveniently gives rise to the complementary set of concepts. Quantity, causality, observation, classic measurement, language, events, quants, units, and so on. So it would seem that there is a duality here. Continuum and discrete descriptions of the world are like wave and particle descriptions of the world. The private, macroscopic, low-velocity instances of our physical descriptions of the universe, our theories, tend to be continuous. Newtonian time is equated to a river. Space is a yarn. Einstein was the last classicist. Relativity just means that no classical observer has any preference over another in formulating the laws of physics and in performing measurements. Nothing else, nothing more. Einstein's space-time is a four-dimensional continuum. What commenced as a matter of mathematical convenience had been transformed into a hallowed doctrine. Homogeneity, isotropy, symmetry, they became enshrined as the cornerstone of an almost religious outlook. outlook. Wasn't it Einstein who said, God does not play dice? These were assumed to be, all the above were assumed to be objective, observer-independent qualities of the universe. There was, a, there was supposed to be no preferred direction, no clustering of mass or of energy, no time, charge or parity asymmetry in elementary particles. The notion of continuum was somehow interrelated. A continuum does not have to be symmetric, homogeneous or isotropic, and yet somehow we will be surprised if it had turned out to not be so. As physical knowledge deepened, a distressful mood prevailed. The smooth curves of Einstein gave way to the radiating singularities of Hawking's black hole. These black holes might eventu eventually violate conservation laws by permanently losing all the information stored in them, which pertain to the masses and energies that they had assimilated over time. Singularities imply a tear in the fabric of space-time, and the ubiquity of these creature, creatures completely annuls the continuous character of space-time. There are so many black holes, so so many holes in the fabric of space-time, that actually space-time is rendered discontinuous. Modern superstrings and supermembranes theories, like Witten's M-theory, so on, 
they talk about dimensions which curl upon themselves and thus become non-discernible, non-observable. Particles, singularities and curled up dimensions are all close relatives and together they seriously erode the tranquil continuity of the space-time of yore. But the first serious crack in the classical intuitive Weltanschauung was opened long ago with the invention of the quantum theoretical device by Max Planck. The energy levels of particles no longer lay along an unhindered continuum. A particle emitted energy in discrete units called quanta. Others developed a model of the atom in which particles did not roam the entire interatomic space. Rather, they circled the nucleus in paths which represented discrete energy, energy levels. So, not two particles, that's the Pauli exclusion principle, not two particles could occupy the same energy level simultaneously. And the space between these levels, the orbits, was not habitable. It was non-existent, actually. Uh, there was a transition there to a highly discretized, highly discrete view. The counter-continuum revolution spread into most fields of science. Phase transitions were introduced to explain the behavior of materials when parameters such as pressure and temperature are changed. All the materials behave, in the, same, behave the same way in the critical level of phase transition. And yet phase transitions are discrete, rather surprising events of emergent order, epiphenomenal. There is no continuum which can accommodate phase transitions. The theory of dynamical systems, best known as chaos theory, has also violated long-held notions of mathematical continuity. The sets of solutions of many mathematical theories were proven to be distributed among discrete values, called attractors. Functions behave catastrophically in that minute changes in the values of the parameters result in gigantic divergent changes in where the system settles down, finds a solution, collapses in a way. In biology, Stephen Gould and others have modified the theory of evolution to incorporate qualitative, non-gradual, uh, discrete jumps from one step of the ladder to the other. The Darwinian notion of continuous, smooth development with strewn remnants, missing links, attesting to each incremental shift, this Darwinian view has all but evaporated, expired. Today we have punctuated equilibrium. Psychology, on the other hand, had always assumed that the difference between normal and deranged is a qualitative one and that the two do not lie along a continuous line. Psychological disorder is not a normal state exaggerated. Now, psychology is reverting to a dimensional model, defying the general flow of science towards the discrete. The continuum way, the continuum way of seeing things is totally inapplicable philosophically and practically, there is a continuum of intelligence quotients, IQs, and yet the gifted person is not an enhanced version of the mentally or intellectually challenged person. There is a non-continuous difference between 70 IQ and 170 IQ. They are utterly distinct entities, people, and not reducible to one another. There's no way to translate 70 IQ to 170 IQ. Another example, many and few. These are value judgments or cultural judgments of elements of a language used. And the same goes for big and small. Though theoretically both are points on a continuous line, they are qualitatively disparate. We cannot deduce what is big by studying the small unless we have access to some rules of derivation and decision-making. The same applies to the couplets, order, disorder, element system, evolution, rev revolution, and not alive, alive, 
All these are discrete states, not continuous states. What is alive? What is life? And what is not alive? This is at the heart of the applied ethical issue of abortion. When should a fetus or an embryo begin to be considered a live thing? And what about viruses? Are they alive? Prions. Life springs suddenly. It emerges. It's an epiphenomenon. It is not more of the same. It is not a matter of quantity of matter. It is a qualitative issue, life, almost in the eye of the beholder. All these problems in a variety of disciplines call for a non-continuum approach, for the discrete emergence of new phases, order, life, system. The epiphenomenal aspect, properties that characterize the whole, but which are nowhere to be found when the parts comprising the whole are examined and investigated. So the epiphenomenal aspect is accidental, incidental to the main issue. The main issue is the fact that the world behaves in a sudden, emergent, surprising, discrete manner, sometimes unpredictable. There is no continuum out there except in some of our descriptions of nature. And even this seems to be for the sake of convenience and aesthetics, an ideal description. But renaming or redefining a problem can hardly be called a solution. We selected the idealization of continuum in order to make our lives easier. But why? Why does the continuum make our life lives easier? How does it achieve, accomplish this effect? In which ways does it simplify our quest to know the world in order to control the world? In which ways it enhances our chances to survive? There are two types of continuum, spatial continuum and temporal continuum. All the other notions of continuum are reducible to either of these two or both. Consider, for example, a wooden stick. A wooden stick is continuous. It's finite, um, but continuous. You could be finite and continuous. The two are not mutually exclusive or mutually exhaustive. Yet, if I were to break this wooden stick in two, its continuity will have vanished. Why? What in my action of breaking the stick made the continuity of the stick disappear? And how can my action influence what seems to be an inherent, extensive property of the stick? We are forced to accept that continuity is a property of the system that is contingent and dependent on external actions. This is normal. Most properties are like that. Temperature, for example. Pressure, for example. But what made the wooden stick continuous before I broke it? What made it discontinuous following my action? And, so it would seem, because of my action. It is the identical response to the outside world. All the points in the macroscopic wooden stick would have reacted identically to outside pressure, torsion, twisting, temperature, etc. It is this identity of reaction that augments, defines and supports the mental category of continuum. Where it ends, discontinuity begins. This is the boundary, this is the threshold. Breaking the wooden stick created new boundaries and now pressure applied to one part of the stick will not influence the other and will influence that part differently to what it would have been expected to influence the total stick. The requirement of identical reaction to reality will not be satisfied now and the two newly broken parts of the stick are no longer part of the continuum or actually parts of the stick. The existence of a boundary or a threshold is intuitively assumed even for infinite systems like the universe. This plus the identical reaction principle are what this is this is what give the impression of continuity. The pre-broken wooden stick satisfied these two requirements. It had a boundary and all its points reacted simultaneously 
to the outside reality in the same manner. Yet, these are necessary but insufficient conditions. Discrete entities can have boundaries, can react simultaneously as a group, and still be highly discrete and discontinuous. Consider, for example, a set of the first 10 in integers. This set has a boundary. This set will react the same way simultaneously to any math mathematical action or manipulation, for example, multiplication by a constant. But here, there's a crucial difference. Let's go back to the stick. All the points in the stick retain their identity under any transformation, under any physical action. If they're burned, they will all burn into ash, to take a radical example. All the points in the stick will also retain their relationship to one another. The structure of the stick, the mutual arrangement of the, of the points, the order, the channels between them. The, integer, the integers in the set will not. Each integer will produce a result, and the results will be disparate. The results will form a set of discrete numbers, which is absolutely distinct from the original set. The second generation set, the one created via multiplication, will have no resemblance whatsoever to the first generation set of integers. For example, hitting the wooden stick will not influence our ability to instantly recognize it as a wooden stick, to recognize it as the wooden stick, the specific wooden stick. If the wooden stick burns, we will still be able to say with assuredness that a wooden stick had been burned, at least the wood had been burned. But a set of integers in itself does not contain the information needed to tell us whence it came, where it came from. What was the set that preceded it? We can't reverse engineer from the multiplication set to the integer set. Here, additional knowledge is required, the exact laws of transformation, the function which was used to derive the secondary multiplication set. The wooden stick, therefore, conserves and preserves the information relating to itself. The set of integers does not. We can generalize and say that a continuum preserves its information content under transformations, while discrete entities or values behave idiosy idiosyncratically, and so do not. In the case of a continuum, no knowledge of the laws of transformation is needed in order to exact, e extract the information content of the continuum. The converse is true in the case of discrete entities or discrete values. We need to know the operating laws. In these conditions, the existence of a boundary or a threshold, the preservation of local information, and the uniform reaction to transformation or action, these conditions are what made the continuum such a useful tool in scientific thought. Paradoxically, the very theory that had introduced non-continuous thinking to physics, quantum mechanics, is the one that is trying to reintroduce uh, this kind of uh, continuum. Now, it's the notion of field. The notion of fields in physics is manifestly continuous. The field exists everywhere simultaneously. So when quantum physicists um, deal with fields, when they introduce fields into quantum theories, quantum field theory, for example, they're actually harking back to the days of the continuum. They were the ones who rendered physics discrete, and now they want to go back and become continuum supporters, continuum fans. Action, action at a distance, which implies the unity of the, of the universe, implies the continuity of the universe, was supposedly exercised by quantum mechanics, only to reappear in space-like interactions and, of course, in entanglement. Elaborate and implausible theoretical constructs are dreamt up in order to get rid of the contamination of continuity, but it is a primordial sin, not so easily atoned for. 
The measurement problem, which I'm going to discuss momentarily, is at the very heart of quantum mechanics. If the observer actively participates in the determination of the state of the, of the observed system, which admittedly is only one possible interpretation, then we are all observer and observed, members of one and the same continuum. And it is discreteness which is imposed on the true continuous nature of the universe, not the other way around. This is, of course, the Copenhagen interpretation, but in the many worlds interpretation, what I've just said applies perfectly to the multiverse. So let's talk about measurement. We have seen that continuum and discreteness have their problems. Let's discuss measurement. The most basic act or action in physics, the most rudimentary unit of acting as a physicist, Arguably also the most intractable philosophical question attached to quantum mechanics. Measurement. The accepted, the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics says that the very act of, a, of sentient, intelligent measurement determines the outcome of the measurement in the quantum micro, microcosmic realm. The wave function, which describes the coexisting superposition state of the system, collapses following an act of measurement and observation, sentient act. Now, there's another interpretation, the many worlds interpretation. There are many other interpretations. But if you delve deeper into these interpretations, you end up with sentience. You end up with an observer or you end up with a decision maker. For example, it is a decision maker who splits the world, splits the universe into its branches in the many worlds hypothesis or uh, explanation of quantum mechanics. It seems that just by knowing the results of a measurement, we determine its outcome. We determine the state of the system and by implication, the state of the universe as a whole. This notion is so counterintuitive that it fostered a raging debate, which has been going on for more than nine decades now. But can we turn the question, and inevitably the answer, on its head? Is it the measurement that brings about the collapse? Or maybe we are capable of measuring only collapsed results. Maybe our very ability to measure, a very capacity to design measurement methods and instrumentation, to conceptualize, to formalize the act of measurement, maybe they are limited Maybe they are designed to yield only collapsible solutions of the wave functions, which are macrocosmically stable and objective, pointer states. Indeed, pointer states are reminiscent of the strange attractors of chaos theory. Most measurements are indirect. They tally the effects of the system on a minute segment of its environment. The experimental instruments. Uh, Wojciech Zurek, I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly, Z-U-R-E-K, and others proved that even partial and roundabout measurements are sufficient to induce um, Einselektion, or environment-induced superselection. In other words, even the most rudimentary act of measurement is likely to probe pointer states. Superpositions are notoriously unstable. Even in the quantum realm, they last an infinitesimal uh, moment of time. Our measurement apparatus is not sufficiently sensitive to capture superpositions. By contrast, collapsed or pointer states are relatively stable and lasting, and so can be observed and measured. Maybe there's a bias in the very act of measurement, the instruments of measurement, the interpretations of measurement, bias towards collapsed states and away from eigen selections, super selections, super uh, positions, and entangle entanglement even. Um, maybe this is why we keep measuring only collapsed states. But in which sense, excluding their longevity, in which sense are collapsed states measurable? What makes them 
measurable. What gives them the quality of being measurable? Collapse events are not necessarily the most highly probable. Some of them are associated with low probabilities, and yet uh, they still occur and they are still measured. Even when they are extremely have extremely low probability, they still happen, and we still can measure them. By definition, the more probable states tend to occur, they tend to be measured much more often. The wave function, function collapses more frequently into high probability states, needless to say. But this does not exclude the less probable states of, quantum system, of, of the quantum systems from materializing upon measurement. Pointer states are carefully selected for some purpose within a certain pattern in a certain sequence. What could that purpose be? Probably the extension and enhancement of order in the universe. That this is so can be easily substantiated by the fact that it is so. Order increases all the time. The anthropocentric and anthropic view of the Copenhagen interpretation, conscience, intelligent observers, determine the outcomes of measurements in the quantum realm. This anthropic and anthropocentric view associates humans with negentropy, the decrease of entropy, the increase of order. This is not to say that entropy cannot increase locally and order decrease or low energy states be attained. Of course, locally, entropy can fluctuate, it can increase, order can decrease, low energy states can suddenly materialize. But it is to say that low energy states and local entropy increases are perturbations, and that overall, order in the universe tends actually to increase, even as local pockets of disorder are created. The overall increase of order in the universe should be introduced, therefore, as a constraint into the quantum mechanics formalism. Yet surely we cannot attribute an inevitable and invariable increase in order to each and every measurement, to each and every collapse. To say that a given collapse event contributed, had contributed to an increase in order as an extensive parameter in the universe, we must assume the existence of some grand design within which this statement would make sense. We must also define, undermine, the only rule in physics which is in, not controversial, and that's possibly the second rule of thermo, thermodynamics, the growth in entropy. Such a grand design a mechanism must be able to gauge the level of orderliness at any given moment, for instance, before the collapse, for instance, after the collapse. Such a grand design must have at its disposal sensors of increasing or decreasing local and non-local order. Human observers are such order-sensitive instruments, for example. And still, even assuming that quantum states are naturally selected for their robustness and stability, in other words, for their orderliness, how does the quantum system know about the grand design? How does it sense it? How does it, it inter interact with the grand design, the quantum system? How does the quantum system know its place within the grand design? How does it know to select the pointer states time and again? How does the quantum realm give rise to the world as we know it? Objective, stable, certain, robust, predictable, and intuitive. If the quantum system has no a priori awareness of how it fits into an ever more ordered universe, how is the information transferred from the universe to the entangled quantum system and measurement system at the moment of measurement precisely? Such information must be communicated super, superluminally at a speed greater than the speed of light. Quantum decisions are instantaneous and simultaneous while the information about the quantum system's environment emanates from near and far, takes time. But what are the transmission and reception mechanisms and channels? 
Which is the receiver? Where is the transmitter? Is it action at a distance? What is the form of the information? What is the carrier of the information? Do we have to postulate yet another particle to account for, for the, this carriage, this conveyance of the information? And another, no less crucial question relates to the apparent arbitrariness of the selection process. All the parts of a superposition constitute pot potential collapse events and therefore can, in principle, be measured. Why is only one event measured in any given measurement? Why not all of them? How is this event selected to be the, the collapse event, the measurable collapse event? Why does this collapse event retain a privileged status, privileged status versus the measurement apparatus, the measurement act, and the observers, we? It seems that preferred states have to do with the inexorable process of the increase in the overall amount of order in the universe yet again. If other states were to have been selected, order would have diminished. The proof is again in the pudding. In the pudding. Order does increase all the time. Therefore, measurable collapse events and pointer states tend to increase order by definition. There is a process of negative order-orientated selection. Collapse events and states which tend to increase entropy are filtered out and statistically avoided. They are measured less. There seems to be a guiding principle, principle of the statistical increase of order in the universe. This guiding principle cannot be communicated to quantum systems with each and every measurement because such communication would have to be superluminal. Uh, superluminal. The only logical conclusion is that all the information relevant to the decrease of entropy and to the increase of order in the universe is already stored in each and every part of the universe. The tiniest portion of the universe has this DNA of increase in order, no matter how minuscule and how fundamental this particle is. Everything in the universe has this information. Do your best to increase order, avoid states, avoid measurements, avoid events which decrease order and increase entropy. The universe is a battle, is a war against entropy. The universe is a fighter against entropy. It is the antithesis of entropy. We tended to, to think that entropy is the, the state of the universe. It's not. The universe is fighting off entropy. It is safe to assume that, very much like in living organisms, all the relevant information regarding the preferred order-favoring quantum states is stored in a kind of physical DNA. The unfolding of this physical DNA takes place in the physical world during interactions between physical systems. One of these interactions is, of course, the measurement act and the measurement apparatus. The biological DNA contains all the information about the living organism and is replicated trillions of times over, stored in the basic units of the organism, the cell. What reason is there to assume that nature deviated from this very pragmatic principle in other realms of existence? Why not repeat this winning design strategy in quarks, in elementary particles, in quantum, quantum systems? The biological variant of DNA requires a biochemical context, an environment, to translate itself into an organism, an environment made up of amino acids, etc. The physical DNA probably also requires some type of context. The physical world is revealed through the act of measurement. The information stored in each and every physical particle, each and every quantum system, is structural because order has to do with structure. Very much like a fractal or a hologram, every particle reflects the entire universe accurately, and the same laws of nature apply to both, the biggest and the smallest. Consider the startling similarities between the formalisms and the laws that pertain to subatomic particles 
and, for example, supermassive black holes. Moreover, the distinction between functional, operational, and structural information is superfluous. It's artificial. There is a magnitude bias here. Being creatures of the macrocosm, we are macros, macro, macro, macroscopic creatures, macrocosmic creatures. Because we are, we have a bias. Form and function seem to us to be distinct. There's form and there's function. But if we accept that function is merely what we call an increase in order, then the distinction is cancelled because the only way to measure the increase in order is via the structure, structurally. Structure, therefore, seems to be an indicator of function, the way we measure function. We measure functioning, the increase in order, using structural methods, the alignment or arrangement of instruments in an experiment. And still, the information contained in each particle should encompass at least the relevant close, non-negligible, and non-cancelable parts of the universe. This is a tremendous amount of data. How is this data stored in ti tiny corpuscules, in tiny you know, capsules, in tiny elementary particles? Well, either by utilizing methods and processes, which we are far even from guessing, or else the relevant information is infinitesimally, almost vanishingly, small. The extent of necessary information contained in each and every physical particle could be somehow linked, even equal to, the number of possible quantum states, to the superposition itself, or to the collapse event. It may well be that the whole universe can be adequately encompassed in an unbelievably minute, negligible, tiny amount of data, which, which are incorporated in those quantum supercomputers that today, for lack of a better understanding, we call particles. A technical note before we move on to time. The universe can be mathematically described as a matched or PLL filter, whose properties let through the collapsed outcomes of wave functions when measured or the signal. The rest of the superposition, the other universes in a multiverse, for example, the noise, not the signal, can be represented as noise. Yeah. So the signal is the collapsed states, and the non-collapsed states are the noise. Our universe, therefore, enhances the signal-to-noise noise ratio through acts of measurement, a generalization of the anthropic principle, actually. And I refer you to an article in 2004, by Olivier uh, Paulin, P-O-U-L-I-N, and Zurek in Physical, phys, uh, Physics Review Letters, uh, volume 93. And also Zurich's uh, preprint in uh, auxiv.org in 2004. Let's now discuss time. In my work, Time is what we call the set of potentialities of a field. So if we were to specify all the potentialities, it's an infinite set, of course. If we were to specify all the potentialities of field, this is what we would call time. And some of these potentialities are masses. Some of these potentialities represent motion, energy. Some of these potentialities represent space, what we call space-time, including the shape of space-time, curvature, and so on. And all these potentialities put together are what I call time, because potentialities need time to be realized, to materialize and manifest. It's the only precondition, only boundary condition for potentialities. But let's go back to Newton. A directional time does not feature in Newtonian mechanics in electromagnetic theory, in quantum mechanics, in the equations which describe the world of elementary particles, with the exception of K on decay, and in some border astrophysical conditions where there is time symmetry. And yet, despite the fact that our physics has no time arrow, no preferred direction of time, we perceive the world of the macro as time asymmetric, and our cosmology and thermodynamics explicitly incorporate a time arrow, albeit one 
which is superimposed on the equations, not derived from the equations. The introduction of stochastic processes has somewhat mitigated this conundrum, but has not solved it. Time is therefore an epiphenomenon. It does not characterize the parts of the system we call universe, though it emerges as a main property of the whole. Time is an extensive parameter of macro systems. In my doctoral dissertation, the dissertation um, is available through the Library of Congress, In my doctoral dissertation, I postulated the existence of a particle. I called it chronon. The dissertation dates back to 1982-1983, and so it predates most of the work done on chronons much later. Time, I suggested in my thesis, is a result of the interaction of chronons, very much as other forces in nature are transferred in such interactions. The chronon is what you might call a time atom. Actually, it's an elementary particle. It's a time quark. We can postulate the existence of various time quarks, up, down, colors, etc., whose properties cancel each other when they are in pairs, for example. And so this way, we can naturally derive the time arrow, time asymmetry. My postulated article, the chronon, is not only an ideal clock, but also mediates time itself. It's like the relationship between the Higgs boson and mass. In other words, I propose that what we call time is the interaction between chronons in a field. The field is time itself. Chronons exchange a particle I mean, they are an exchange particle, and thereby they exert a force which we call time. Introducing time as a fifth force gives rise to a quasi-deterministic rendition of quantum theories and links inextricably time to other particle properties such as mass. What we call events and what we call elementary particles, these are perturbations in the time field, in the chronon field. And they are distinct from chronon interactions. Chronon interactions, the particle exchange, in the time field generate time with a small t and time asymmetry as we observe them. My work is therefore a field theory of time. The universe is observing itself, is materializing itself, is collapsing itself. It is the only privileged observer, the universe. It is the only frame of reference, the universe, and it restores intuitive Einsteinian determinism to physics. Time space can be regarded in my work as a wave function with observer mediated collapse. All the chronons are entangled at the exact moment of the Big Bang. This yields a relativistic QFT with chronons as its field quanta, excited states. The integration is achieved via the quantum superpositions. Another way to look at my work uh, is that the metric expansion of time is implied if time is a fourth dimension of space. Time may even be described as a phonon of the metric itself. A more productive approach may involve perturbative QFT, uh, quantum field theory. Time from the Big Bang is mediated by chronons, and this leads to expansion, including in the number of chronons. In this case, there are no bound states, nor is there any need for dark matter or dark energy. Chronons as excitation states, stochastic perturbations, vibrations, tie in nicely with superstring theories, but without the baggage of extra dimensions, and without the metaphysical nonsense of music of the spheres. Perturbations also yield general relativity. I derived all of general relativity from my chronon field theory. Cumulative emerging perturbations amount to a distortion, a curvature of, of space time, of time space. Both superstring theories and general relativity theory are therefore private cases of my chronon field theory. Aiton Suchard took my work and converted it into a geometric view. He has a geometric view of my work. And he went light years ahead. Um, 
for example, by discovering technological applications of my theory. He suggested that interacting particles with non-gravitational fields can be seen as clocks whose trajectory is not Minkowski geodesic. A field in which a small enough clock is not geodesic can be described by a scalar, scalar field of time whose gradient has non-zero curvature. The scalar field, S-C-A-L-A-R, sorry for my thick accent, the scalar field of time is either real, which describes acceleration of neutral clocks made of charged matter, or it is imaginary, which describes acceleration of clocks made of Majorana uh, type matter. This way, the scalar field adds information to space-time, which is not anticipated by the metric tensor alone. The scalar field can be realized as a coordinate because it can be measured from a reference sub-manifold along different curves. In a Big Bang manifold, the field is simply an upper limit on measurable time by interacting clocks backwards from each event to the Big Bang singularity as a limit only. In the Sitter, anti the Sitter space-time, reference sub-manifolds from which such time is measured along integral curves are described as all the events in which the scalar field is zero. The solution need not be unique, but the representation of the acceleration field by an anti-symmetric matrix is unique up to SU2 by, a, by U1 degrees of freedom. Matter in Einstein-Grossman equation is replaced by the action of the acceleration field by a geometric action, which is not anticipated by the metric alone. And this idea leads to a new formalism of matter. It replaces the conventional stress-energy-momentum tensor. The formalism will be mainly developed for classical, but also for quantum physics. The result is that a positive charge manifests small attracting gravity and a stronger but small repelling acceleration field that repels even uncharged particles that measure proper time, in other words, have a rest mass. The negative charge manifests a repelling anti-gravity, but also a stronger acceleration field that attracts even uncharged particle, the particles that measure proper time. They have a rest mass. I want to read this, I want to, to recap this because it's it's a core issue. The result of the vaknin suchard theory, let's call it this way, is that positive charge manifests small attracting gravity and a stronger but small repelling acceleration field that repels even uncharged particles that measure proper time. They have a rest mass. The negative charge manifests a repelling anti-gravity but also a stronger acceleration field that attracts even uncharged particles that measure proper time. In other words, have a, work, have a rest mass. The theory leads to causal sets. Space-time exists only where Cronon wave function collapses. There's still a lot of work to be done. We need to replace particles by strings of collapse events. The theory in its quantum form is of events, not of particles. Uh, but the theory already has technological repercussions and strong implications regarding what we call today dark matter and dark energy. I refer you to Aiton Suchard's paper on arxiv.org, A-R-X-I-V.org. The paper is titled Electrogravity via Geometric Chronon Field and on the Origin of Mass. Again, the author is Aiton, A-Y-T-A-N-H Suchard, S-U-C-H-A-R-D. And I'm going to read to you the abstract to wrap up this video lecture. The abstract. In 1982, Dr. Sam Vaknin pondered the idea of reconstructing physics based on time as a field. His idea appeared in his doctorate dissertation as an amendment to the dirac spinor equation. Sam saw the quantum field theory particles and momentum and energy as a result of the language of physics and of the way the human mind perceives reality, not as reality itself. To the author's opinion, 
such as opinion. It is a revolution of the language itself and is not a new interpretation of the existing language. The special theory of relativity was a revolution and so was the general relativity theory. But these theories did not challenge the use of momentum and energy, but rather gave them new relativistic interpretation. Later on, quantum mechanics used energy and momentum operators, and even Dirac's orthogonal matrices are multiplied by such operators. Quantum field theory assumes the existence of particles which are very intuitive and agree with the human visual system. Particles may be merely a human interpretation of events that occur in the human sensory world. This paper says, says the author, Sacher, this paper elaborates on one specific interpretation of Sam Vaknin's idea that the author had developed from 2003 up to August 2018. It is a major improvement of previously published papers and it summarizes all of them and includes all the appendices along with new ideas. A key idea in this paper is that while a preferable coordinate of time violates the principle of general relativity, a scalar field does not because it does not point to any preferable direction in space-time. Moreover, such a scalar field need not be unique. So this is to give you insight into the chronon field theory. I am open to questions or comments and so on and so forth. I hope you had fun meandering through physics from Newton to Vaknin, and Sartre actually. And chronon field theory is a very exciting theory, I think, for two reasons. Number one, it replaces the previous language, the Newtonian, Leibnizian, Einsteinian quantum language, which used momentum, energy, masses, space-time, antiquated language. It replaces this language with a new language. Actually, this new language has a single entity, a single word. Cronon field theory is much more parsimonious and adheres much more closely to Occam's razor. And by common, common agreement, if a theory produces falsifiable predictions and is more parsimonious, it's bound to be more true, so to speak, closer to the truth than the previous theory. So in my theory, as, as evolved by Aiton Sachert, there's only one word, time, and that's all we need. When we take time, we produce the rest of physics, all of it, no exception. So par parsimony, Occam's razor in my new theory. The second advantage of, I think, my new theory is that, is that it naturally proposes a unification of all the forces of nature and of quantum and rel relativistic approaches to nature. So it unifies quantum mechanics and relativity. It unifies all the forces of nature. It dispenses with pseudo-mystical or quasi-mystical entities which defy measurement and observation, like dark energy and dark matter, defy direct measurement and observation. It bases everything on measurable, observable collapse states in experimentation. And it provides an understanding of the world, understanding of reality and the universe, that is far closer, far more intuitive, far more deterministic, and far closer to a universe which is conducive to life, order enhancing, and honestly, had someone designed such a universe, he would have chosen chronon field theory or general relativity theory. He would not have chosen, I believe, exactly like Einstein, some variants of quantum mechanics. Even Einstein's general relativity theory is way too complex. Take the tensors, for example. Way too complex. Too many entities, multiplication of entities, um, multiplying of entities. Um, mathematics is way too complex. Things must be simple. Simplicity is beauty. Beauty is truth. I believe chronon field theory offers exactly this. Thank you for listening.